Over five years ago, I did a video on one of the most interesting and influential characters we've ever encountered in the Fallout universe. A character that was responsible for both the lost and recovered past of the Courier, as well as their future. An individual who yearned to reignite industry, to reclaim the lost glory of humanity. An individual who could genuinely be one of the few hopes for the continued march of progress for the human race. The individual I speak of is, of course, Robert Edwin House, known to the player as Mr. House. The video in question was one of my earlier, poorer works, and as such I have removed it from the channel. In this one, we're going to do this man a proper service, and really delve into his character. In doing so, we're going to find out exactly why the house always wins. If we are going to start anywhere, it may as well be at the very beginning. Robert Edwin House was born on June 25th, 2020. His parents' names are never told to us, only the manner of their death. A... A freak accident involving lightning and an autogyro... What the fuck? An autogyro, by the way, it differs from a helicopter by the way it generates lift. Suffice to say that, going off of the little we have here, his parents were both in the autogyro when it was struck by lightning, and they were both killed. Likely from the crash, as opposed to the actual lightning itself as that would be, <laughs> that would be pretty funny. After this, his half-brother Anthony fucked him over. At the time, his father's company, H&H &H Tools Company, with one of the H's presumably being House, was a provider of high-quality robotics equipment. This is likely where the inspiration for Robert to enter the field himself came from. Anthony seen himself as the sole deserving heir, and somehow managed to gain control of Robert's inheritance, though how he did so remains unknown. Anthony's story is a sad one, of paranoia and mental illness, one we touched on in my video on the H&H &H Tools Company, but perhaps a topic that deserves a video all to itself. After this occurred, Robert went on to attend the Commonwealth Institute of Technology, or CI2. Now, as we know, this eventually evolved into the Institute scene in Fallout 4. However, this time, it's reasonable to assume that no one was really prepared for, or at least expecting, the near total destruction of society by nuclear war. To this end, we can guess that Robert had no hand in the modern day creation of the Institute. Nevertheless, he did attend CIT, and we can assume he acquired a great deal of expertise in various fields, as well as the credentials to go with them, based on what he did next. After leaving CIT, he went on to find Rob Co at the age of 22, on his birthday. It is here we must ask ourselves if this occurred only a year after he finished university, or whether he started and finished early. Either one is still incredibly impressive. Robco itself has a long and interesting story, being the creators behind everything from the Pip-Boy to Liberty Prime. We can go into more detail another time, if you would all like. Suffice to say, the company was one of the most profitable on Earth in only half a decade, which stands as a testament to Robert's abilities. According to a terminal entry by one Jenny DeSoto from H&H &H Tools, the company's corporate structure seems to have been purposely designed to prevent anyone from figuring out who was in charge, or its inner workings. This likely indicates that Robert himself wanted to stay out of the limelight, letting the company remain the focus, while he could reap the benefits behind the scenes. After this, his company gained more and more power, absorbing the likes of Repcon Aerospace, which we covered somewhat in our video on both it and the Q35 matter modulator, and vast tracts of real estate on the New Vegas Strip, including the Lucky 38 Casino, wherein he resides to this day. He also managed to get revenge on his brother, destroying the company with aggressive trading practices, though somehow Anthony still seems to have been in charge even up to the bombs hit him. To be honest, his brother kind of deserved it. He was an asshole. The one odd thing that seems to come up was his encounter with a starlet that he supposedly dated. Now, this is second-hand information from, I'm gonna mispronounce this, Raoul Tejada, and he is a few centuries on at this point, so take it with a pinch of salt. According to him, House wanted to scan her brain and make her wear different outfits. Now, the outfits part is normal enough, I guess, but it's the brain scan part I find very interesting. Remember, Robert did in fact scan and utilize the brain of at least one other woman that we know of. Jean, a Securetron that keeps him... Ugh, entertained. Her neurocomputational matrix, her personality and thoughts, are meant to have been a copy of a woman Robert either knew, dated, or had relations with. 
This makes it likely that he was attempting to either collect a copy of this woman's brain to either do the same to, or she was one of the first. Sometime over the next 18 years, he had begun to run mathematical and economic models, basing his data off of the current political and socio-economic state of the world, in order to predict the course of world affairs, likely so he would have a leg up in taking advantage of them. However, by 2065 he determined that the world was going to be wiped out within the next 15 years, a prediction that was spot on in fact, as it occurred only 12 years after. He learned a crucial piece of information from his menagerie of contacts and resources. The Chinese had approximately 77 warheads pointed directly at New Vegas. With the impending destruction of his life's work imminent, and armed with the knowledge of this before it occurred, Robert devised a plan, a plan that, while it wouldn't save the world, could perhaps preserve just a portion of humanity. A plan that had wide-reaching implications, even two centuries later. A plan that, for the most part, revolved around a platinum poker chip. Not a chip made of platinum, but because of what was on the chip. A chip that was worth more than the combined representative value of every other chip in New Vegas. His plan was to mount a laser defense system of his own design on the roof of the Lucky 38 Casino to shoot down any Chinese warheads that approached New Vegas. Obviously, this would be difficult given the speed and volume, so this was the second layer of defense. The first made use of his extensive network of mainframes at his disposal. Using his predictions, he is able to utilize the mainframes to disarm 59 of the warheads, resulting in them impacting, but not detonating. The remaining 18, unfortunately, got through, and would have to be dealt with by the lasers. As we know, this is not what happened. Along with upgrading his Securitrons, which we will get to, the laser system was also to be upgraded by the Platinum chip. The chip itself was a data storage device, designed at great personal cost to Robert. Given the limitations of storage technology in the pre-war world, it's safe to assume that this was a leap forward, both in its capacity and its size. Its proprietary nature meant that special hardware only House had access to was required to read it. This chip was printed the day before the war, 20 hours to be exact, and was never delivered. It was to upgrade the laser defense system with a new OS, one which, according to House, would have stopped all 18 of the warheads that got through, not just 9 of them, and would have led to much more of New Vegas being preserved, which was his overall goal. I suppose it was achieved to a certain extent, as none hit the city itself. The losing of this chip caused damage to more than just the surrounding area as a consequence of the warheads. It also caused damage to Robert himself. It is here that we need to stop and consider Robert's goals at this time, and how he was going about to achieve them. He wanted to survive, but not just that, to thrive. He wanted New Vegas to do so as well, but to achieve that, he would need to be there to guide it, as he seen himself as the only person capable of doing so, and if his obituary is to be believed, statistically, he pretty much was. So to enable himself to see this all the way through to the end, he underwent a pretty major procedure. Now, I will go into this in much more detail in a video on life extending technology soon, but suffice to say, Robert went into a kind of stasis. He entered into a preservation chamber deep inside the Lucky 38. This chamber preserved his body, to an extent, but linked his brain, and by extension his consciousness, with his mainframes and securitrons. Although a downside was its isolated environment had left him vulnerable to contaminants from the outside, in such a way that he'll die within a year if exposed. It could also be argued that, instead of a cryonics chamber, given his body's decrepit appearance, it's more akin to a brain bot. We will analyze all of this in another video. All we need to know right now is that he integrated himself with his mainframe and was dependent on it in many ways. The damage to himself was as a result of not having the chip and as a result of having to rely on an older version of the OS, a version that, as well as not allowing his laser system to operate at full capacity, doesn't seem to have been properly optimized or designed to work with his newly integrated self. As a result, once the system was activated, the glitches and crashes began. The immediate consequence was Robert having to take the Lucky 38's reactor offline, in case it suffered a meltdown, which would have put him firmly up shit creek. Over the next five years, he had to deal with power outages and continual crashes, all the while seemingly building up the instability of the system, until, eventually, he was left with no choice but to reboot to an even older version of the OS, 
but seemingly a more stable one. This reboot wasn't planned, however, and the result of this hasty action put him in a coma for more than 61 years, while the world fell apart around him. After coming out of the coma, he remained behind the scenes, not taking action until the NCR took up residence at Hoover Dam. Up to this point, he had remained hidden in a locked up Lucky 38, in a mostly desolate but still intact New Vegas, then being vied over by what would become the three families. After he detected the NCR scouts at the Hoover Dam, his secure drones rolled out and made contact with what would become the three families, promising wealth and security. In exchange, they would help to supplement his somewhat limited forces, given the issues with the platinum ship. He taught them how to start casinos and he began rebuilding New Vegas to settle it. With all this in place, he was set to bargain with the NCR from a position of power, selling the idea of New Vegas to them as the jewel of the Mojave. He signed a treaty with them, allowing them access to Hoover Dam and the McCarran Airport, free of any trouble with either his Securitron forces or the three families. New Vegas was protected from annexation under this agreement, as by his own admission, the NCR was still strong enough, at the time anyway, to take on his army and the three families, and win. The NCR set about fixing the dam, meaning Robert didn't have to, and he still got the benefits of access to power from it, once it was repaired. This was vital, as his own emergency power reserves had begun to deplete over the years, with them close to being empty when he woke his first batch of Securitrons. So he was shrewd enough in his dealings, at least to the extent wherein he can make full use of the NCR, with very little in the way of a drawback. Around this time, while rebuilding New Vegas, he took control of Vault 21, a vault that we covered several years ago. If you want the full story on it, the video can be found in the New Vegas playlist. Suffice to say, he stripped the vault of all technology he deemed useful, and turned the rest of it into a hotel. The casino parts were already there from the vault experiment. This, combined with the other areas opened in New Vegas, and the provision in the treaty he signed with the NCR preventing them from stopping people from entering New Vegas, all served as a springboard for the economy he was growing, all to further his plans. Also around the time Robert came out of his coma, he began the hunt for his platinum chip, an endeavor that cost him, in his own words, millions of caps in all. Over 800,000 caps were spent in the year of 2280 alone, this may seem extravagant, but as we know, it was the key to his plans, to the future of New Vegas. As well as giving him a more stable OS, and finally fully upgrading the lasers in the Lucky 38, the chip would not only upgrade his secure drones to their full combat capabilities, but also unlock the vault onto the fort. This would give him access to not only more powerful secure drones, but a much larger force as well. A force large enough to remove his dependence for security from either the NCR or the three families. Before he had the chip, he only had enough strength to bring them to the bargaining table, and because a war with him would have left them vulnerable to the Legion. Now, however, he would have enough strength to take on all comers, and secure his rule, completely. But what was all this for? He preserved New Vegas, at great personal cost, and now he rules it. But why the need for more technology and power? What was he aiming for? Well, it's pretty simple. He wanted to establish humanity, to establish civilization. See, the NCR provided him with power, and the stability they introduced to the region, such as it was, as well as their numbers, gave New Vegas a huge influx of customers. It truly became the jewel of the Mojave. Robert described New Vegas as the remedy to mankind's derailment, as a blast furnace in which the steel of the new rail line running to a bright, new horizon could be forged in. He took all the people of the Mojave and the NCR who were yearning for luxury, and he gave it to them, in turn providing him with control, wealth, and materials. All of this was to be used to reignite human development. He claimed that, in 20 years, he could reignite high technology development sectors. In 50, he'd put people in orbit. By 100, he planned to do what the original Enclave had tried and failed to achieve. Send people out in colony ships, to new planets that could be settled free from the poisons the earth was now subject to. His goal was to become an autocrat. Now by his own admission, he had no wish to legislate or control what others did in their private time. He had no wish to abuse people, and found slavery itself abhorrent. He wasn't looking for worship or deification. All he wanted was to use the power this position would afford him 
to guide New Vegas and humanity itself to a future much brighter than the one that could currently be seen. Now, the argument against autocracy is always something along the lines of power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Well, to be honest, I think that's a load of gobshite. The world has changed. Changed severely. Humanity is not what it once was. And to expect old supports of order and politics to hold up a completely new world structure is sheer ignorance. The NCR is a prime example of a democracy in the wastes, and it's not doing too great. Meanwhile, let's look at what the man himself has done. He founded one of the most successful advanced companies in the world. He himself contributed to many of the inventions and technologies that made it so. Hell, going off of the large portrait found in the house resort and country club, he may have been involved directly in the creation of Liberty Prime. He is a genius, whose forward thinking shielded the majority of the Mojave and all of New Vegas, meaning most, if not all of the people, are alive there today because of his actions. He showed people how life could be, not how it really was, and gave people a dream they could focus on. His army of Securetrons would have provided better protection than any human army. Since they were completely under his control, there was no chance of someone else with less beneficial goals taking over, like with most autocracies. If his timeline claims were accurate, he could take humanity further now than it may have been possible for pre-war humanity to go. I mean, the man did have 200 years to think, and now he has essentially unlimited resources. Who knows what technologies he has developed in that time frame. Life extension technology aside, of course. I believe that, in a situation like this, an autocracy is only a detriment when the individual's goals aren't directly beneficial to the people they're presiding over. But in this case, he's offering a return to pre-war levels of comfort, and even beyond, he's offering people in constant danger a level of security unheard of. He's offering unity and progress the likes of which they've only heard about in Legends. The claim can be made that he may go astray eventually, but given how long he's been at this, and how much he's invested, it seems unlikely he would, at least outside of a timeline of centuries. Another reason that oh so many people forget is fucking tunnelers. I've covered them in another video, so I won't go into too much detail. Suffice to say, they spread and breed rapidly, and they can tear death claws apart. Given time, they will spread beyond the divide. Ulysses himself described them as a slow death for the Mojave. They will be able to overwhelm almost any force in opposition to them. Except, maybe a non-human one, with power greater than two armies. Robert, with his Securetron army, and genius level intellect, is probably the only individual equipped to actually deal with this threat. A threat, by the way, that no one else outside the Divide is really aware of. However, for many people, all the above reasons weren't enough, and they responded to his offer of a bright future by exposing him to the elements, ensuring his death in approximately a year. After this happens, his Securetrons gave out obituaries, titled, A Tragedy Has Befallen All Mankind. It makes several claims, but the important parts are the ones of the effect of his death. It claims that he was the only hope for mankind, and the chance of an equally capable figure emerging from the current human population that could achieve the same future is less than 0.000112%, so less than a thousandth of a percent. Though it doesn't detail what factors were actually used to derive this number. It could be a lie, but considering it's likely he wrote it himself and given his drive to see humanity to a better future, it doesn't seem likely that it is one. So there you have it, Robert Edwin House, leader, innovator, visionary, and genius. His forward thinking and brilliant mind founded one of the most powerful corporations on earth, and saved New Vegas from nuclear destruction, and a large portion of the surrounding Mojave itself. He extended his own life, rebuilt New Vegas, and bargained with the NCR itself, all for his ultimate goal, to raise mankind from the ashes of nuclear war, and lead it to a brighter future. Also, in my opinion, to protect us from tunnelers, a threat he may or may not have been aware of. Whether or not you made the choice to side with him is likely down to how you personally feel about his goals. But what you can't deny is that, whether he deserved to lead it into the future, New Vegas of the present exists because of him. Hello everyone, it's been a while since I've done a video on New Vegas, and the last time I covered House, it was a video of a much lower quality. 
Hopefully this time around it was up to snuff. If you thought so, a like or a comment is always appreciated. Remember to hit the bell icon and enable notifications, or else YouTube will likely decide not to show you my content when it comes out. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope to see you in the next one. And until then, goodbye.